All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. Today, I am joined by repeat guest Luke Groman, who is the founder and president of Forest for the Trees. Welcome back, Luke. Thanks for having me back on, Michael. Easy for me to say. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> me too. Me too. All right. So we've got uh, an enormous amount of ground to cover. And you know, I haven't really spoken to you since we've had sort of the, the banking crisis that we've seen play out over the last couple of months. And I want to get there. But you, I think better than, than almost anyone else, are really good at drawing out the connection in between the price of energy and the sort of balance of payments problem that we're facing in the United States. And I thought you just summed it up so well in, in your most recent piece. And maybe I can start as a jumping off point with a bit of a joke, <laughs> but it's also very instructive, which is there's a story. This is that the quote to open your piece here. There's a story that's been going around about a physicist, a chemist, and an economist who were stranded on a desert island with no implements and a can of food. The physicist and the chemist each devised an ingenious mechanism for getting the can open. The economist merely said, assume we have a can opener, which is an awesome quote. Can you like talk about why Why did you lead your recent uh, piece off with that? And then like, maybe we can get into the, um, the interplay between the cost of energy and what we're seeing with rates in the banking system. The assume a can opener piece we wrote about a month ago for clients was based on an observation that I've been making where we're seeing this, uh, this lengthy debate about where our star or the neutral rate of interest is or is more debt inflationary or deflationary or and and i see these academic pieces these fed speakers and they're all just talking about rates 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 and there is no discussion of what is going on with energy and the point here is 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 in my view these policymakers economists etc are having an assume the can opener moment they are mm. assume peak cheap energy is not an issue. Assume that that uh, for the first time in their careers, uh, they have a situation where the marginal cost of energy is more and more and not less and less uh, for the biggest for what is still the biggest source of energy for humanity, which is which is oil uh, in particular. So uh, it was really the assume a can opener. It was sort of a poke at this blind assumption, this focus on rates and our star and 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 what have you, while completely ignoring the geological reality, which is leads to this very fundamental conundrum, this fundamental dilemma, which is the debt levels are so high. Broadly speaking, when Western sovereign, uh, global sovereign uh, levels are so high, they need lower and lower rates. They need negative real interest rates. They need low inflation just to keep that debt from blowing up. At the exact same time and for the first time in their careers, they also need uh, or they, they've always also needed more energy, right? More energy consumption to drive the economic growth to prevent that debt from blowing up. But for the mm. first time in their careers, the cost of that marginal barrel of oil, the cost of the marginal ton of copper is going up notably. And so basically it leads to this fundamental conundrum where assume a can opener. Let's just assume the price of energy isn't going up structurally. The marginal price of energy isn't going up. And then we can sort of make all the debt uh, because if you actually have to look at what reality is, which is the marginal barrel of oil cost, according to the Dallas Fed, rose 8 to 10 percent last year. Then you have to start. You recognize you're sort of screwed because it means you need to find a sucker at the card table who will hold 30 trillion dollars in debt just for the U.S. alone. At a rate below eight to ten, eight to ten percent rate at which energy is growing. So basically, you need to find a a balance sheet willing to make itself very poor very fast in energy terms, and that balance sheet doesn't exist outside the world central banks. Yeah, so much laid out there, Luke. And maybe we can, for those in the in the audience who might not be as familiar, could you sort of tease out uh, why the link in between the price of energy and interest rates for those of you who might be maybe scratching their head and trying to figure that out. And I thought you worded it so great in this letter, which is sort of this natural, this financial discount rate versus the geological discount rate. So could you kind of explain why you chose that wording and then link, uh, maybe go into the link in between the price of energy and uh, discount rate in the US? 
a couple great quotes. There's from, from an anonymous monetary theorist um, from 25 years ago. And I'm going to read them to you because I think they really phrase, they, they really frame it well. So, uh, quote, in central bank circles, it's well known that the world debt markets as we know them can only be maintained with cheap and cheaper oil. Without cheap oil, the entire system fails. And then there's another quote, same guy, oil's managed from the standpoint of supply, not demand, as demand is infinite for this now indispensable substance. The world economic need for oil has built our modern financial structure as an upside down pyramid on oil. Every business, every asset, every debt, every currency and every army are priced in currency terms that reflect a full supply of cheap oil. So. When I say that there's in the report, I noted there's a geological discount rate and there's a financial discount rate. And that's really this assume the can opener uh, point I make, which is everybody is focused solely on the financial discount rate. What's our star? What's the Fed going to do? What? Uh, OK. And then there's this geological rate that, to be blunt, doesn't give a shit about any of what they're saying. And in fact, the higher they raise rates, uh, the bigger the discount, the, the bigger the, the, the discount rate. And the reason is energy is the master discount rate. Then that's what they said. The price of everything has a cheap energy component in it, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And that's the point about assume, assume a can openers. For the last 40 years, basically, of these people's, of, of most economists' career, my career, everybody's career, you've just been able to assume a can opener, assume cheap energy, assume cheap and plentiful supplies. And we can't anymore. Uh, we can assume plentiful, but not cheap, or we can assume cheap, but not plentiful. And that changes everything. So uh, I have a chart in the report that shows exactly what this, the implications of this are, which is any time the U.S. Uh, uh, oil consumption as a percent of GDP, which is just straight barrels times you know price divided by GDP, you know, barrels times uh, price times uh, barrels per day times 365 days times mm. price divided by annual GDP on a nominal basis. Anytime it gets much above 3%, the U.S. has a sustained either recession or stagflation. And that's the crux of this whole thing. The 1970s, basically from 73 through 80, you were above that 3%. You were above it for a cup of coffee when Saddam invaded Iraq for the first time in 90, or excuse me, invaded Kuwait in, in the first Iraq war in 90. And then you were above it from basically 05 through 13 or 14 with the advent of U.S. shale. So you get into this dynamic of when oil gets too expensive, rates go up, stagflation happens, recession happens. And that's fine when you have not a lot of debt, but we have a lot of debt. So they're fundamentally incom incompatible. So that's really where I come at it from the discount rate, the nature's discount rate. Hey, everyone. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is the one that we do with Bankless. It is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year, September 11th through the 13th. If you've been in crypto for a while, you know that bear market conferences are the best conferences because those are the one that all the alphas at. This year, we've got a phenomenal lineup of speakers and the topics that we're covering are insane. We're going to be talking about ZK Tech, Rollups, Account Abstraction, MEV, App Change, the whole suite of stuff. I cannot wait myself. So because you're a listener of this podcast, you're also going to get a discount. Type in pods20 and you're going to get 20% off your ticket. Click the link at the bottom of this episode and go get it now because prices go up every two weeks. Many of us, especially in the macro world, we live in this world of central banking and the treasury and the Fed, and they're the ones that are setting the cost of money. But we live in a world where there are certain natural realities, right? So walk me through like, we're in this weird state, right? We've got an enormous amount of debt, not very much growth. We've got inflation that may or may not be coming off. And then we've got this bogey out of left field, which is what if the, the, the geological discount rate, the oil keeps on going up? So can you kind of walk us through in that scenario, what are the implications of that happening? Oh, it's enormous. And this is the biggest, it, it's the biggest or one of the biggest blind spots for most uh, economists and, 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 you know, macro people I follow just from the standpoint, again, everyone is so focused on rates and dollar as the base layer, but the rates and dollar have never been the base layer. Energy has always been the base layer, always. Yeah. It's just that we haven't had to worry about it for a long time. So the point here is, is that the blind spot is, I should say, is that shale bought us time. 
So if you look, uh, the, uh, Bloomberg citing Enveris Energy uh, set, noted recently that 90%, 90% of the, of the growth in global oil production over the last 10 years has come from U.S. shale. And U.S. shale is peaking in its own right unless prices go a lot higher over time uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and as the Fed and, and, it, and shale is, is interest rate sensitive. So mm. last year, importantly, so we've got this 90% of global growth. It's peaking geologically unless we get much higher prices. And last year, the U.S. did two things that actually made the problem worse much sooner, which is number one, uh, they, the Fed raised rates at the fastest pace in 40 years. And, and interest uh, or shale is interest rate sensitive. Um, and number two, oh, with a little bit of a lag. And number two, the U.S. government released uh, SPR oil to cap oil prices. Again, here too, at the fastest pace in 40 years. And so while I understand why they did it, there was a geopolitical imperative. Um, mm. It ultimately uh, was penny wise, pound foolish, because what they really did is put a bullet in shale. Uh, and so by virtue of the ge geology of these of this production, uh, it depletes really fast. So if you don't keep going faster and faster, it's a red queen problem from Lewis, Lewis uh, uh, Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. If you don't, you got to run faster and faster just to stay in the same place. And uh, by what they did with rates, by what they did with the SPR, they brought oil prices back down. Great. That was a nod to getting oil down, fighting Putin, and also helping defend the U.S. Treasury market. Because the fact is, is that you look at what was happening last year as oil prices were going up and up and up. This was putting a whole slew of oil importing creditor nations around the world, Japan in particular, India, um, uh, uh, Europe, even China, uh, into a position where they were going to have to, they were aggressively selling Treasury bonds to buy oil. Uh, to buy energy because the price of oil had gone up so much. So it was a de facto move. The SPR release and the rate hikes were de facto moves to defend the treasury market. But this gets back to that nature's discount rate, right? If mm. oil prices go up too much, foreign nations have to sell treasuries aggressively to buy oil because the other option is, is hey, let's just stop buying oil so we can keep holding our treasuries. And that is translates to, hey, let's institute economic Armageddon in our own country so we don't sell the Americans treasuries, right? Because you start shrinking your oil consumption in a developed economy, in a highly levered developed economy, that leads to really, really bad economic outcomes. So uh, it is the discount rate uh, across, um, across a wide array of assets. And that includes the quote unquote risk-free asset. Help us connect this geological discount rate and the price of oil with kind of a balance of payments problem for the United States. And you have this great metaphor, actually, of Lucy and the chocolates of like kind of a, an assembly line of, of treasuries that, uh, you know, have to get have to get um, consumed in order for the system to stay afloat. And that, I think, is the thing that's in jeopardy. So help us connect this uh, discussion of energy with sort of the, the fiscal situation of the U.S. and, and the treasury market. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, to simplify, if you look at uh, you can break the world down into energy exporters and energy importers. Mm -hmm. And then within the energy importers, there's two groups. There are, uh, there's the United States, um, historically, and, and I know people can say, oh, we're not an importer. And that's, that's, that's true, but just stay with me here. Historically, the U S was an energy importer, but, and, uh, and, uh, ran deficits, but we, that was, that was the magic of the dollar's reserve status as it's been structured since 50, since, since 71. So energy importers that are creditors to the U.S. is the other group. That's Japan, China, Europe, uh, historically, not as much in, in recent decades, um, India to a lesser extent, right? So you've got the energy exporter creditors to the U.S., OPEC and Russia, historically, the energy importer creditors to the U.S., um, that latter group. When oil goes up a bunch, the way the system worked historically was OPEC and Russia bought a lot more treasuries and the importers sold treasuries, right? So that, that kind of kept it. And we, our job was basically 
don't create so many treasuries, so many chocolates that they can't, you know, they can't buy them all. They can't keep the, the, the treasury market from being dysfunctional, a word we've heard a lot in the last four years mm. um, and never before that. Uh, when oil prices fell a lot, then the OPEC in Russia was selling treasuries and the energy importers were buying more because their dollar needs, um, they basically, they got, they got a tax break, right? Oil prices fall, they import a lot of oil, they have a lot more dollars because the price of oil fell, they can buy more treasuries. Okay. Last, in, in the last nine years, global central banks have on net stopped buying treasuries. Uh, and so when that happened, you started having, you know, this Lucy and, and the chocolates skit where the conveyor belt is still running with chocolates and Lucy's putting in her mouth and in her apron and her hat. And that's <laughs> what's been happening. You know, we've stuck, you know, the hat is the banking system, the, the pockets are the, are the money market fund regulate reforms that force them to do it. And, um, they're stuffing them everywhere. And, and, you know, Lucy's mouth is, is the feds balance sheet. Um, that has that 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 has been a a fragile equilibrium as long as oil prices have stayed flat as long as oil prices have gotten cheaper and US shale has helped that dramatically mm -hmm. uh with the spike in energy last year with the russian sanctions and the disruptions that caused around energy markets that upset that fragile equilibrium uh where suddenly energy prices spiked now the energy buying, the energy importing creditors of the U.S., and in particular uh, Japan to a lesser extent Europe, but basically that whole group, they had to sell treasuries to buy energy. So now you've got an incremental supply to add on top of the accelerating conveyor belt uh, just from the U.S.'s selling, the Fed's selling. And on the other hand, uh, OPEC not really buying treasuries. Uh, Russia, certainly not for obvious reasons. And then uh, OPEC was already sort of moving away from that for some of these same geological reasons we highlighted before, which is they don't want to be the sucker at the card table where they sell oil, they buy treasuries, and then the price of oil goes up 10% a year over the next 10 years on average, as the Dallas Fed says it's going to need to just to keep supplies basically flat globally. And they're going to end up depleting their energy supplies. They're going to have a pile of treasury paper that buys them a lot less energy at the end of the period than they did at the beginning of the period. So OPEC has been moved, doing what China's been doing for a while, what Russia's been doing, which is buying assets that better hedge energy inflation than treasuries, gold, equities, uh, domestic infrastructure to improve the lives of their citizens, uh, et cetera. So you've got this situation where energy goes up. They're, the, the energy importers are selling treasuries. The other side, the natural counterbalance, um, is not buying for another reasons we just highlighted. Some of them geological, some of them political, etc. OPEC, who has more surpluses, are not buying treasuries um, as they had historically, and so it accelerates this imbalance to uh, the treasury market. And we saw that again last year, where we saw the treasury market not functioning. So, you know, September Yellen said that, or late, I guess. Uh, Early October, Yellen said that we saw some sloppy auctions, et cetera. Um, and, and so that is this fundamental dynamic where uh, you've got the Fed selling with QT. You've got the U.S. government's structurally rising deficits, not just because of entitlements, et cetera. But now you've got them piling on with higher interest rates, with the slowing economy, with what the Fed's done. And now you've got this imbalance on the foreign side where given the choice between I can hold energy uh, or in, in, buy energy, or I can continue to hold my treasuries. Everybody buys energy. It's 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 not a choice. This is what I found myself thinking when I was reading your your piece. So there are all these different variables that are existing out there, right? And the market generally thinks that the Fed is in control. And here are all the factors that I see happening. Right, we've got this ballooning sort of national debt that no one really has a great solution for, right? I think the solution that most people sort of tacitly think is it's going to be some form of financial oppression, right? Where bondholders are basically just going to take the hit and it's going to be some sort of soft default in the, in the form of inflation. But then you start to layer on these other things like the geological discount rate. So, ooh, now when you kind of take into account the price of oil, now that negative real rate that you thought you were going to have to 
you know, press on bondholders, you, you're probably going to have to double that to account for the cost of energy. Oh, but at the same time, you know, the Treasury, and I've heard you talk about the Pentagon's influence on this as well, they decided to yank about $400 billion worth of uh, Russian central bank assets. So like maybe marginally, right, we can count on, you know, central banks, foreign central banks to buy less treasuries. Ooh, uh, so then we'll, well, that's no problem. We'll rely on our domestic banks. Ooh, wait a second. We just raised interest rates at the fastest rate in a hundred years, and we blew up our domestic banking system because we made them take the treasuries. So, you know, for so long, I kind of, now I'm like, how are all these factors going to resolve themselves, you know? And I think it does come down to this question of who is going to buy these treasuries. So I know you're kind of just getting into that, but do you agree that that's kind of the perfect storm conundrum that we found ourselves in? And what do you think is going to going to happen from all this? Yeah, it is. It's a perfect summary. And that's, was, uh, you brought up the great point that I had left out, which is that we also dissuaded OPEC and the rest of the world that would have been seeing higher surpluses uh, with higher oil prices from adding to their treasuries by freezing Russia's FX reserves. So uh, what's going to happen? The Fed's going to buy it all, ultimately. That's yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, they're going to print the money. They're going to buy it. They're going to institute yield curve control. They've already taken two baby steps in that direction with uh, the BTFP is a yield curve control for banks. It's a soft version. Um, the treasury buybacks that start in 2024 when the BTF pro P program is in theory going to lapse just coincidentally um, is a soft firm form. And they, they don't want to do YCC because YCC for them is the Hotel California. Once they go YCC, it's not gonna be like Japan. People say, oh, it'll be like Japan, it'll, it'll be fine. It won't be, it will feel like Argentina. You will see the price of everything do this. And so they know, and that's, that's where it's heading. They don't want to do it, but that's what they're ultimately going to have to do. However, path matters, right? So if you're trying to trade this, Number one, if you're the average person, I would not try to trade this. And I don't try to trade this. This is all about getting from here to there. The volatility has been enormous. And it's and it's been enormous in things we haven't seen it in, right? We've seen it in G7 currencies, G7 rates. Uh, you know, when, when the two-year treasury trades like Dogecoin, uh, like it did in March, um, that's, that's telling you be very, very careful. Something is important is happening here. So I don't... The Fed's going to have to do it, um, but it, it highlights this conundrum. It, it absolutely highlights this, this conundrum because these commentators that say, well, we just need to do whatever we can do to get inflation down. We just need to put the economy in a recession. Uh, number one, the fiscal situation, the U.S. and, and other Western sovereigns will nominally default on their obligations in that scenario. They, they, the debt to GDP, the deficits to GDP are too high. Um, and number two, when you take it back to this geological discount rate, again, you, the 90% of the world's uh, global production growth over the last decade has come from U.S. shale, which not only needs higher prices to grow, but last time I checked the EIA's productivity report in the big four U.S. shale basins, uh, it was declining at a 6.1% per month rate. Now, it doesn't mean that U.S. shale production would fall 72% a year, right? 6% times 12 months, because it's a very nonlinear decline. The rate of decline declines as you get further away from uh, as, as the wells age. Uh, so the way it produ product shale well looks as you produce, you spike up and then it falls quickly. And then there's sort of a, a long tail on it, right? Yeah. So shale, 90% of the world's production growth over the last 10 years would probably fall. If you just stop today, a year from now, it would probably be down 20 to 30%. And so that's what the central bankers I don't think understand. I think a lot of the, the discussion, and that's why I say assume a can open, right? Is well, let's just put them in a recession, take inflation down. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. You put us in a recession a year from now, you're going to take 15, 20, let's be conservative, 15, 20% of U.S. shale offline. And that's been 90% of production growth over the last 10 years. And to provide some context for this, global oil production growth or uh, demand growth, global oil demand growth uh, going back for the last 60 years. COVID was the biggest year-over-year -year decline 
8%. And that was when we shut the whole economy down, uh, by and large. The second biggest was 1980 or 82, and it was down 3% year over year. There was never a bigger decline in global oil demand than those two, going back 60 years. So this is this blind spot, this assume a can opener view from the, from the economic community, the economist community, which is, well, let's just fight inflation, take a recession down. You're going to wake up in a year and yeah, you might get sort of a brief blip down in inflation. But as shale production rolls off, you're going to have a much structurally higher energy inflation uh, because the supply is going to fall much faster. Uh, than demand does, uh, even under the most draconian demand scenarios. So I don't get the sense they understand this very well, and maybe they do, and that this is why they're doing what they're doing, is that they're panicking. I don't know. I want to be a little careful with my words. I have a lot of empathy for them, right? Like, if I were in that position, I would have no idea what to do. But also, you need some accountability. Like, they they put themselves in the situation as well, at least. <laughs> uh, you know. So I, I don't know where to draw that line. It's kind of tough. But... I'd love to get your thoughts. Actually, you, you brought up a couple of concepts that I wanted to dig in a little bit further, which is yield curve control and sort of Japanification. And I heard you say we aren't going down that route. So I want to poke into why you think that. But YCC, I, more of a uh, comment than a question. I completely agree with you. BTFP, it, it's a it's a soft form of y, yield curve control. And one thing that they could do to maybe add like a funnel to Lucy's mouth, so to speak, right, is to just lower the interest rate payments on BTFP. That'd be like a super simple way, right, for for uh, you know banks to want to buy more treasuries because then you even if treasuries fall, you get the par value uh, as collateral. So that's something you can or do. Why and- the, yeah, or widen out the collateral. You know, you can you can it, switch it to other assets. You know, hey, let's put CRE in there, right? Let's put CRE, you know, the commercial mortgage backed securities in there too as collateral. That's that's that'll probably come at some point down the line, but that's that's it, there's some time, but yeah. I agree with you, Luke. And, you know, it, the other thing is that I think is worth highlighting is central banks aren't going to come out and say, hey, we have decided to implement yield curve control. They're going to they're going to do the alphabet soup, right? It's going to be the BTFP with a lowered interest rate and an expanded yeah, array of collateral. So, right. I think it's just an important point for listeners is we shouldn't expect Powell to get up there, Chair Powell, to say, uh, we've decided to implement YCC. They're just going to do it sort of tacitly. Um, and call it something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. When they when they do admit that that's what they're doing, it's it's a crisis, right? When Powell got on sixty right. minutes and said, "Yeah, we basically we printed money," right? They were crapping their pants on the deflationary side, and <laughs> and they probably shouldn't have been, but they were. And so when they do admit it, you know, the S and P is probably going to be a lot lower than here. Asset prices will be lower in here, what have you. <laughs> exactly. So so why do you think? I, I'd love to uh, sort of. Japan is just such an interesting. It's such an interesting topic because they've just gone so far down this path of let's call it maybe monetary uh, experimentation. We also have a, a new central bank governor over there, uh, Ueda, who, to be honest, I, I haven't paid an enormous amount of attention to. But you know, they have gone further down this path than anyone of you know. Let's just expand debt, you know, indefinitely. I think it's two hundred and twenty percent or something debt to GDP over there. The uh, debt servicing costs are twenty five percent annual of their annual budget. So pretty crazy. And I think it's gone way further than almost anyone has imagined. I mean, what do you think about the situation playing out in Japan? I heard you say that it wasn't necessarily a guide for the United States. Why not? Well, I think the game plan is a guide. I think the outcome is going to be like Argentina uh, in terms Ah. of the inflationary impact, right? So Japan, people, people want to say, well, we'll just be Japan. And Number one, Japan is a current account surplus nation, right? They run a massive trade surplus. And so by virtue of running that massive trade surplus, we don't, right? We have a Mm -hmm. a large current account deficit, twin deficit. Uh, By virtue of that trade surplus, that current account surplus, Japan has amassed a massive net international investment position to the positive. Uh, I want to say it's like 60% of GDP positive net international investment position. And the way to think about that is, That's Japan's piggy bank, right? They run a trade surplus against the U.S. and then they take those dollars and they invest them into dollar assets and other assets around the world. Okay, so they've got a massively positive net international investment position. Uh, They have a very homogenous society. They have their defense in no small part provided for them by the United States. Um, uh, And and so these are, are some very important ways in which they are different from the U.S. Let's look at the U.S. 
The United States is a current account deficit. We have a net international investment position of negative 70% of GDP, 70%. So foreigners own on net $18 trillion in dollar denominated assets um, uh, more than we own of theirs. Uh, the U.S. provides defense, not just for Japan, but others. Um, and, and the point in all of this, the reason why it will feel more like Argentina and not Japan than is simple is Japan has the option at any point to say, we're break, we're, that's it, we're taking our ball, we're going home, which is to say this 60% net international investment position piggy bank, we're going to break the piggy bank and we're going to sell the dollar assets and we're going to finance our deficits we're going to fa finance our debt for a long, long time. And you're starting to see that happen uh, as a side note. The U.S., on the other hand, you know, not, not, not so much, right? So mm -hmm. the U.S. has a net international investment position. There is no piggy bank. The Fed is the <laughs> piggy bank. They, you know, it, when it, there, there's no glass to break and bring the money back. The mo it, foreign assets are already all here. So, um and the other thing, too, by the way, is by virtue of all of this, Japan, deflation is an option for Japan. Uh, they can have deflationary, um, they can have a deflationary economy and their system still works, right? Because they're a current account surplus, because they've got these foreign assets on net. Uh, they can have deflation and still have a rising standard of living. The debt market still works. De facto, we've seen that for the last 20, 30 years. The United States cannot have deflation, cannot. They have deflation, the debt goes boom, the assets go boom, everything goes boom fast. Um, and so fundamentally, the U.S. cannot be Japan. Uh, we can go down the same path, but there's a lot of people that take comfort from like, oh, well, don't worry, it'll just be like the last two or three decades, like the Japanese. Like, no, it won't. Like, no, it won't. It is going to be the last two or three decades like Argentina where you just have, you know, 10, 12 percent inflation. And, and and that's what you get when you do dumb stuff with borrowed money and you're a twin deficit nation and you start losing your foreign creditors, which, oh, by the way, is exactly what happened to, to Argentina and a lot of different you know, sort of uh, emerging market countries. Um, and it's happening to the U.S. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. Yeah. So I, I heard you, you know, use the example of, of Argentina there. I think last time I checked, Argentina's inflation rate annual was something like 97%, right? So maybe we could start to put like a little bit more specifics around. Obviously, it's kind of like the path is unknown, right? But, you know, what should we be expecting here? Because right now, like if I had to try to get the zeitgeist of this particular moment in time is, you know, the rate hiking cycle has probably topped out. Maybe we have like one more 25 basis point hike in us, but all the leading indicators point to, you know, disinflation, if not outright deflation. You know, we now have a federal funds rate that's above CPI. We're, we're probably done. But what I'm hearing you say is like, hey, some of that is out of our control. There's this energy component that everyone is ignoring. There are all these other bigger, geo like just debt issuance uh, components that we're ignoring. And ultimately, we're going to need negative real interest rates, and we're going to have a high rate of inflation here. So what do you think that actually kind of looks like in the next couple of years? If I don't know. Um, so <laughs> this is all speculative. Um, mm. My best guess, and this could change tomorrow, but my best guess is that we'll get a square root market in the next two years, which is to say mm. whoosh down, panic, print, much back to a much higher original level. And the reason I say it, and I think the whoosh down could probably come in the second half of this year um, because I don't think the Fed's going to be proactive. Um, and I think 
not even I think you can see it setting up. It, and I guess it isn't my thing, but but there is a capital crunch coming. The U.S. government needs to borrow an enormous sum of money and restock the TGA. Uh, commercial real estate needs to borrow an enormous sum of money, refinance, recap. There's a margin call there. Uh, venture capital likely needs to borrow an enormous sum of money. Uh, and there simply isn't the balance sheet to finance all three of them at current interest rates and or current dollar level. Uh, and so I think you're going to get a pretty big capital crunch um, in the next three to six months. And I don't think that'll be good for anything. And that's where things start to get really interesting for the Fed, because obviously you have this energy thing where there's a peak cheap energy dynamic to it. Uh, but the Fed is into a uh, position they haven't been in, right? They're losing money, right? They're, mm -hmm. You can see it in their balance sheet, right? Where uh, their remittances to Treasury are massively negative. They're upside down um, yep. because short-term rates are high and the yield in their portfolio is lower. Uh, the other side of that same coin is... There is what the Fed is doing is raising U.S. deficits, right? So when you raise interest rates, you're raising interest expense. We've never gone through a rate hiking cycle in any of our lifetimes with debt to GDP at 120 uh, percent. So we're they're just making it up as they go along um, or, as I like to say, messing it up as they go along. But uh, <laughs> they are raising rates. That is increasing the deficit. There's no functional difference between raising interest expense 600 billion and handing out a $600 billion stimmy. Uh, the only difference is who it goes to and how quickly it gets spent into the economy. It's the same thing. Now, what's, so deficits are going up because of interest expense, primarily along with some secular stuff with entitlements. On the other side, what the Fed's doing with rates is they're shrinking private sector capacity. Right. You were seeing this, uh, you know, private lending is tight. So we are, I think, still going to get some deflation for a little bit longer, but we're getting to a point in the game. There will come a point in the game. We're not there yet, but we're getting to a point in the game where listen to what I just said. Deficits are rising due to interest rates rising, which is just a stimmy to the rich people. And, you know, <laughs> I say that casually, right, to the wealthy, to the asset holders. Uh, so it's a little bit more sterilized than true stimmies, but not much. I mean, not, not over time. Um, they're also raising deficits because they're slowing the private sector. So tax receipts are falling, which we've seen. And it's something I've been talking about forever. It's going to happen. It's happening. So the deficits are blowing out. Uh, you're already at deficit levels on an aggregate basis that are, are you know, enormous. The federal outlays are rising at 15 to 30 percent in five of the last seven months. Uh, the only other two times in history when federal outlays have risen at that level at uh, for a sustained basis were December of 08 and March of 2020. Like the economy oh, yeah. was friggin' collapsing. And now they're spending that much because of the interest. Uh, and we've got unemployment still below four and inflation still above four. So this is the uh, the other side of things I don't think people are paying much attention to you, but I think they're going to assume, which is the spending is rising. U.S. government's 25% of GDP. The single biggest actor in the economy is the U.S. government. And they're growing their spending at 15 to 30% in five of the last seven months. While the private sector, who is responsible for creating the capacity to address that printed money, is shrinking or is going to soon start shrinking. So you're going to have a very large increase in dollars being spent into the economy by the U.S. government and a decline in capacity for the private sector to address those dollars. So what's going to happen? Inflation is going to start picking back up. Now what's the Fed do? Guess what? We're going to go higher for longer. OK, great. Take it to eight. Guess what's going to happen? Private sector is going to shrink faster and your deficit is going to rise faster. OK, we'll take it to 10. Uh, we're, we're going to sell bonds. Great. To who? To who? Now rates are up even higher. Now you're... You see where we are like this close? And that's why I say this is an Argentina problem. This isn't a, Ch a Japan problem because Japan would do, that, would do this because we're going to raise rates. And as soon as we raise rates high enough, we're going to repatriate all this capital back. 
And you're yeah. seeing Japanese bondholders bring back capital. It's like, oh, I can get better rates in Japan than America on an, on an FX edge basis. Great, bring it back. There is no bring it back. You know what the answer is? Like I just said, the piggy bank. The Fed goes, oh, God, inflation's five and rates are running away from us. And the more we raise, the more inflation goes up. And now what do we do? And that, that's where the yield curve control comes in. And that's that's why I say this is going to be so tricky. Like, I don't there are things that could change this. Uh, AI could change this. AI could bring this forward. Robotics could change it, could bring it forward. Energy could change this, bring it forward. A war could change it, bring it forward. There's a lot of things. But nobody's watching this. And to me, it's fascinating because it is like watching, you know, a drunk guy shooting up heroin in a car doing 200 towards a wall. And like consensus is like, well, don't worry, he'll he'll stop in time. I'm like, okay, good luck. I'm glad I'm not in the car. But of course I am in the car. Everyone's in the car. Yeah, we're all in the car. We're all in the car. Yeah. So that's I think that's my frustration too, is one of the um, you know, things you hear very often is that, well, government financing isn't like household financing. In in in, in a very important sense, <laughs> that's true, right? But in very important senses, if, it you're, actually if you're an American. Is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, if you're an American, if you're an American, like, like Ameri- it's, it is a uniquely American comment when they say government finance is different, right? Because it is if you're an American, or at least it has been, right? For as long as you, your most, 90% of Americans have no idea that, that say that, have let alone the general population, have no idea of the understanding of the reason that is true is because foreign central banks were sterilizing our, we were literally, the deficits we were running that it didn't matter, they were holding them as their FX reserves, they were holding them as gold. Basically, we were we were emitting gold uh, at de facto, right? And that stopped nine years ago. Like this isn't like oh, it'll be a problem. And it's a problem now. It was a problem then. Now we're just starting to feel the effects. Yeah, and you, like even just you know what people say to complete that, it's not like household financing because you can print money. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, 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 printing money isn't consequence free. I mean, I I really think that will be something that people look back on and everyone will deny that they even said that because I think that's such a silly concept. But yeah, that that tension in between, you know, the bond market and and the US dollar, that I don't think is a very well understood uh well understood relationship there because there, and that's where the energy comes in, right? Like right. that's where the energy, right? You you're going to print that money, like you better increase energy supplies while you print that money. Because otherwise you get into the situation where your energy expenditure goes above 3% of GDP in the U.S., uh, oil expenditure above 3% in the U.S., you go into a recession. And now you're in a recession with debt to GDP at 120%. That's a debt death spiral. You cannot have a recession you, and you cannot have stagflation, right? You get stagflation or a recession. You have stagflation. Now the bond market goes, I'm not holding this crap with 6% inflation at 3%. Okay, great. Take 10 year to 6%. What happens at 10 year at 6%? The U.S. government's bankrupt. Uh that's why energy is the linchpin to all of it. I, in complete agreement here. So maybe now we can sort of transition here to, I would love um, if we could talk a little bit about gold and Bitcoin, right? Because this is kind of this, this crazy setup, right? For hard assets that are kind of a floating reserve asset. And for years, right? Like there's been a distinction always in between the reserve currency and the reserve asset. And obviously as the US is the issuer of both, they're sort of intrinsically tied in this way. But what does this mean, right? Because you know you're looking at uh, talked about this on on this podcast a lot. I'm not a TA guy, but if you pull up the chart of gold, it's forming this like unbelievable uh, cup and handle sort of pattern. Uh, Bitcoin has also sort of responded relatively positively in the last. Uh, it's been a good year for Bitcoin so far. 2022 is obviously a disaster, but like walk us through like what do you think about gold and Bitcoin in the context of everything that we're talking about? I love them both. I think both win either way in the end. Um, yeah. Right. There's people say, well, the Fed's going to raise rates a lot and that's bad for gold. Historically, that was. But none of the la- there has been no time in the last hundred years where if the Fed raises rates too much, they will bankrupt the United States government. And there's nothing more bullish for gold and for Bitcoin than the moment when markets go, oh, my God, they can't raise rates more because the only way to pay the interest is if the Fed prints it. Right. Obviously, the U.S. government's not going to go nominally bankrupt. The, the, the Fed will print the difference. So the U.S. government prints the difference, whatever. But uh, that moment where the market goes, oh, God, inflation hasn't come down. They've raised rates a bunch. They need to raise them more. But from here, the only way to make the interest payments um, are by printing uh, by printing the money. And most people look at that and say, well, yeah, that's true. But we're 
still so far away from that, right? You know, five trillion in receipts and interest expenses, pro forma, right? For, you know, let's use Fed funds. It's not the right number, but it's simple math, right? Five percent times thirty-one trillion, trillion and a half, trillion and a half on five trillion. You're right. You're thirty percent of tax receipts only um, on a pro forma basis. You know, five uh, percent, thirty-one trillion in debt. Um, the reality is, it's a little higher than that, but. I don't think that's the right number. I think the right number is true interest expense, which is U.S. interest expense, that trillion and a half pro forma, plus the three trillion, uh, 3.1 trillion, they're spending on uh, entitlements, uh, mm. PAYGO. And that's 4.6 trillion. And oh, by the way, it's not actually 5 trillion. The receipts are falling pretty notably. So it's we're actually uh, in the first half of this year if you look at the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee report or TBAC report, uh, health, human services, Social Security, Treasury spending, if you add those three categories up, they were more than first half tax receipts. So your true interest expense, you know, the point where the U.S. government cannot pay true interest expense out of receipts, we're there again. We were there in 2020. Uh, we were there in 2021. Um, so we're there again. So they're going to like. And you say, okay, great. That's great for gold and Bitcoin. Yes. However, path matters. If the Fed does not print the money, uh, then as paradoxically, given the dollar's incumbent role as reserve currency and the dollar borrowings out there, the U.S. government's going to crowd out global dollar markets, which we are seeing. Crowding out is suddenly, it's something I've talked about for years. It's, it's starting to become a, a much more popular term. Uh, the U.S. government will crowd out global dollar markets and the dollar will go up and that can put some pressure on gold and Bitcoin in the short run. But ultimately, like I said, from there, the decision point is, OK, the Fed does not print it enough and the U.S. government heads toward default. And there will become a there will there will you will get to a moment where markets go, oh, gosh, they could actually default. And that ain't bad for gold or Bitcoin, in my view. Um, and or the Fed does come in and say, OK, enough's enough. We're going to get, you know, finance the gap with printed money. And that is good for gold and Bitcoin too. So I think ultimately they win either way. Uh, with that said, we've been talking about a very much a barbell approach. Personally, I'm overweight gold, overweight Bitcoin, overweight gold miners, um, along with some energy plays and some industrial equity plays. Uh, but I'm also overweight cash, uh, US dollar cash and short-term treasuries. And we have been all year because I don't know. Uh, you know, I, if, if yeah. Powell is is committed to getting inflation down and either committed to, you know, either either committed to flying into the plane because he feels like it's a worthy mission or flying a plane in the ground, you know, to fight inflation because he feels like that's what he needs to do to fight inflation or more likely he doesn't understand uh, exactly the second and third derivatives of what he's doing. And I think that's more likely because I'm going to try to be gentle here. There's not been a lot of instances where I've seen U.S. policymakers understanding the second and third derivatives of what they do for a long time, by and large. Then I need to be flexible in terms of managing my own liquidity and in terms of keeping my firepower dry, because I, you know, I, I think that's the better way to hedge the volatility uh, that will ensue if the Fed continues to not print the difference. Yeah. I, you know, there was this great interview that Stan Druckenmiller gave recently at the Sone conference. And he had this quote that just really resonated with me, which was, you know, people to paraphrase in a low interest rate environment, people do dumb stuff. When you hold interest rates low for 11 years, people do really dumb stuff. But if you think about the situation the US government has been in since 1971, I mean, they've had essential, not only free financing, but you know, the whole incentive, the whole way that system worked was that we need to export our debt to the world, right? The treasury is the reserve, the reserve asset. And so our government has had this incentive for, you know, coming on 60 years to basically just take on more debt and find easy, cheap financing than we know what to do with. And that is why I think there have been a lot of uh, poor policy decisions that have gone into that. It's the same. It's they're, they're also, they've also fallen prey to low at ZERP sort of thinking. But uh, Luke, unfortunately, we, we've got to wrap it here. This has been a, a phenomenal discussion. And the research that you put together at Forest for the Trees is just so invaluable. And the way you kind of think about things and break down problems is, is very, very unique. Um, can you give listeners, like if they want to find out more about you or the research that you put out, what's the best way to follow you or get more information? 
Sure. So uh, you can find out more about our research product, both mass market and institutional at fftt-llc.com. And they can find out just updates, et cetera. I'm on Twitter at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N. Uh, and I'm, I'm on there, uh, but pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty active feed. So um, they can learn more there as well. Yeah, we we consume a decent amount of research here to prepare for uh, you know Blockworks macro sort of shows. And Luke, I, it's always a pleasure when we get to talk because I have an excuse to uh, go in and read the the last couple issues of FFT. It's phenomenal. So thank you so much uh, for your time, and uh, we'll have to do it again soon. Yep, thanks for having me on. It was great talking again, Michael.